Hello. Today's conversation was with Sebastian Rashka. Sebastian has been working in machine learning for more than a decade and is one of the most prominent educators in the space. Um, previously, he was a professor at, at Wisconsin Madison, and now he's a staff research engineer at Lightning AI, contributing heavily to this open language modeling ecosystem. In his free time, he's a prolific writer on AI content and a surveyor of AI research papers. He's written multiple papers, multiple books, such as Building Language Models from Scratch, which is an early textbook on language models, Machine Learning Q and AI, and he's working on more projects all the time. This is a great conversation generally on how the open ecosystem for fine-tuning language models works, how the dissemination of AI research and AI education works, if AI will disrupt this project process of education, kind of where he sees the future of open models with Llama 3, talking about how being an archive moderator, which he was, helped you familiarize yourself with how AI research is written and many other interesting topics on the state of AI. Enjoy talking with Sebastian Reshka. Hey, Sebastian, welcome to this kind of interconnects normally researcher interviews. You have a you were a professor, so that definitely counts. You do a lot of different things these days, and let's get talking into language models. Welcome. Yeah, um, thanks so much for the invitation, Nathan. I'm a big fan, actually, of the Interconnects uh, newsletter. So, um, you know, I'm hoping we can have some fun chat about research, LLMs, and, you know, what uh, what's hot these days, basically. <laughs> Yeah, I have a whole section on the end, which is like AI, keeping up with AI research, writing about AI and process because you do so many things. But I kind of want to jump into uh, how you got to AI because you have an interesting career path. Um, so you were a professor at Wisconsin Madison for years. I saw in statistics, which and I, was, I also went all the way back to find your PhD thesis, which was uncovering hidden patterns of molecular recognition. So that's this was a while ago. And it is this kind of can you explain your background and how you got into AI? I'm guessing it's through computational statistics or something like this. Um, yeah, uh, close. <laughs> um, so yeah, you did some research there. Um, interesting. So yeah, uh, it's been a long time since uh, my PhD thesis is maybe seven years now. And back then it started even earlier when I got into AI that was like, I would say 2012-ish. Uh, I was in grad school and I was taking a statistical pattern classification class. And in that class... Yeah, the star of the show was basically uh, naive base classifiers, or in, in, in general, like uh, Bayesian methods um, for pattern um, recognition. And from there, I kind of like really got into machine learning. So there was, I would say, more like statistical based, but it was all about classifying things. And then I think it was also um, right about the time where um, Coursera was launched and I saw Andrew Eng's uh, Coursera class. That was, I think, the first class in 2011, 12 back then. And yeah, that's that's basically how I started from statistical pattern classification into uh, machine learning. And I applied that for, you know, like um, computational biology problems like uh, molecule, uh, molecule and um, drug discovery, like pharmaceutical drug discovery. And yeah, from there, I joined at some point uh, after my graduation, um, the University of um, Wisconsin-Madison, where I was in the statistics department, but I did mostly deep learning research, essentially. I was the only one basically doing Python uh, deep learning, machine learning stuff. So yeah, I'm what, like the, what year was this oh, yeah. and what did it look like um, at the time? That was around 2018. Uh, right. I think August 2018 when so, I joined um, the department and yeah, I mean, it's on, so it's the statistics department, but my work was technically all machine learning and deep learning. And back then, um, I mean, a lot of students were really excited about learning machine learning. I think it was just around the time where it got really popular. And yeah, I was teaching machine learning and deep learning classes as well. They were uh, always like, um, you know, full and crowded, like a lot of students were excited about that. Also in general, like the time uh, learning about Python, machine learning, data science, all these topics. Um, it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's pretty already, interesting because I was yeah. a student, I was a grad student at this time or that time in like 2018. That's when DeepRL was really taking off. And it, it probably feels like that probably felt kind of like the language model thing was like as a student at the time where it's just like, there's so many people in all these classes and like now language models have more of a real world application. But I think as a student, it probably feels so, so similar. And yeah, so also back then, if I may say that, it's like large language models already existed. I think the GPT paper, was it 2018? Something like that? Yeah, 2018 out. or 2019. Yeah, 
for GPT two, I, I think. Remember covering uh like I had a, a whole hour or two hours on large language models back then, but it was all focused on bird models and basically also using them for more like classification tasks. Now, uh, I would I would say maybe a lot of business problems still uh, evolve around classification, but everything else is basically generative, uh, generating text, generating images and stuff. So it has changed a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So it's like the sequence of like like what. <laughs> Is it, is it like the transform? Is it like Elmo, Bert, and the Transformers? Mm -hmm. Probably the things that you're talking about all mm -hmm. the time. Just very interesting. I think um, Yite had this. Did you just read Yite's recent blog post on language model architectures and kind of walked through mm -hmm. why encoder decoder is no longer in vogue? And it's like, did you see this? Yeah, I think I haven't seen the article, but I uh, remember having discussions with people about that recently. I mean, um, I think. There was actually, it's interesting. So I think T5, if you would train it and fine tune it, it would still be a really good model for sequence to sequence tasks, like uh, language translation and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, uh, Cohere for mm -hmm. AI did this with Aya. Oh. They, they oh, yeah, used I, T5 yeah, yeah, for yeah. their first oh, Aya see, version, which most mm -hmm. people were like, oh, they've Cohere branded mm -hmm. it so well that no one realized mm -hmm. they're using T5. <laughs> see, I even <laughs> didn't know about that. <laughs> um, and so also on that note, I would say, uh, there was something else I wanted to say. Ah, yeah. So um, then there's also still the classification thing and uh, using LLMs for classification. And it was also usually uh, either a bird, like encoder, or um, you could also use a encoder or decoder, but mostly an encoder. But I've seen also recent papers using just decoder um, models for that. Just basically removing the, I saw two papers on that actually, like uh, removing the causal mask. So basically reverting it back to an encoder B using Llama and then yeah, removing the mask. So it, in that and, sense, and it works well yeah. as a classifier. You could yep, just kind yep, of uh, use it. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I mean, you could even do that without uh, removing the causal mask. So you could just uh, tune the last token basically. But yeah, if you remove it, yeah, they found that it, you could use probably the first token even because if you have the last token, you don't, you have to have uh, padding always because uh, you have to pad it to the longest sequence. Otherwise, um, the last token would be a different one in each training example. And so in this way, you could use an earlier token basically um, and then keep it fixed. Yeah. Yeah. Now with your work at Lightning AI, do you do a lot of these things like hacking around with language models? Because I think it's kind of an underexplored space mm -hmm. where just like people mm -hmm. remove layers and plug things together. I think. Um, there was like a, when merging was just getting going, there was like Frank and mm. Llama two, where mm. somebody made mm -hmm. like a Llama two thirty B by just chopping layers and stuff together. Mm. It's like, there's so much unexplored signal there mm. that I just, do you, have you, have you looked at these things or you don't do yeah, that much? So, um, <laughs> I must say I'm not a big fan of merging. Maybe, uh, I'm just not good at it. <laughs> I rather prefer fine tuning, um, start changing things, uh, training and fine tuning things. So yeah, I do a lot of, um, this type of hacking, uh, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes involuntarily because I make a mistake or something or like, because, uh, at lightning, I developed this, uh, library LitGPT, which is an open source library, pre-training, um, fine tuning and, um, serving and deploying LLMs, but it's basically a from scratch implementation. You can think of it as a uh, nano GPT. Uh, from uh, Andre Kapathy, but for all types of LLMs, like uh, Llama, Gemma, yeah, Phi, all, architectures. All, all of them. But the, the focus is also like uh, Nano GPT is on um, readable code or like keeping it relatively simple. Of course, uh, it gets a bit more complex there when you add uh, multi GPU training, um, tensor parallel, uh, tensor parallel, um, fully shadow data parallelism and stuff like that. So if you add all these settings, it gets a bit more complicated, but the focus is still on having a code base that you can easily work with. And in, in that context, um, it's very easy to remove layers and change things. And, you know, I mean, yeah, so that, that is usually, um, I, I build it, uh, like for colleagues at lightning, but also like for the open source <laughs> community, but then also for myself to, you know, um, to tweak things, to change things and stuff like that. So yeah, and for... I should also say it's not just me, it's uh, Carlos and Adrian who started this library. Currently I'm like the main person maintaining it, but a lot of people uh, contribute to it. So it's actually uh, a nice playground. <laughs> there, yeah. There's kind of two follows on for this. One is like, what part of the language model training stack? If somebody's gonna start with libgpt or hugging face or whatever, like they're trying to fine tune a model, 
what is the thing like you could do an example and then what is the thing that they should do to go like one level deeper to learn how these things work because you're saying with libgpt you can do all mm -hmm. these different architectures i don't know if i would recommend architectures mm -hmm. but it's a good way to learn how like the intention implementation and how different layers are shaped and things like this but is there different areas you'd recommend people to look at? Yeah, I would actually, uh, okay, so it's like a shameless plug, but in, in my book, I have a book where I do this um, step-by-step, -step, the implementation, and this is for only one model, like a simple model, a GPT-2 model, because it's like the, I would say the, the one that started all of this, right? Like the main architecture and everything else is kind of like a derivative almost of it. I mean, derivative in a good thing, in a good way that it is, um, making tweaks and improving things but um, basically starting with one architecture like you said not you know looking at different ones at first and then just understanding what is uh, I would say the best way is what is the input data here how does it look like what does go into the LLM and really how does it pass through the layers and then from there okay we understand how a model learns to generate one word at a time and then going from there to instruction fine-tuning and then um, even like alignment with a DPO, for example. So doing like all these different um, life cycle things from implementing one architecture, pre-training, fine-tuning, aligning. And then from there, I think it's a useful or interesting exercise to see how different architectures make slightly different choices, like replacing the GELU activation with a SILU activation or pre and post layer norm and like these like nuances um changing the number of heads or number of layers and yeah so, yeah i mean in industry everyone kind of is converging to similar things or like people hmm. converge to a similar recipe and then they stick with it uh, upper like to <laughs> infinity for infinity so like each of hmm. the orgs have these recipes that they're it's too hmm. risky to change change and like ai2 are like still converging at a recipe so we're like learning things that the llama team does and it's like rms norm and they think it's very important or like these different things and I wonder how like the open community is going to converge on pre-training things. So like what scale um, of models do you recommend people train for your book? Are they training like the mm. 100 million scale GPT-2? Is it smaller? Because I think in mm. Colab, you can fine tune maybe with Laura a 7B model, I think. Is that true? Mm. Yeah. Um, so this is true. Um, but I think for Laura, if you want to fine tune um, 7B model, you would need, I think, uh, bits and bytes, uh, quantization, the normal float for uh, like some quantization. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so for the, uh, or maybe going one step back for the book, I, it's really um, the smallest model, like the hundred, uh, what is it? hundred something million. But yeah. I also have settings if you, like if let's say your machine permits, use the larger version. So there are four larger versions, like 300, 700 and 1.5 billion. But it's really uh, up to the reader. I have all the examples with the smallest one so that it even runs on a uh, MacBook Air. I'm also on this podcast. I'm here on my yeah. uh, small <laughs> MacBook Air. And um, all the models uh, train in a few minutes fine. Of course, um, I'm not doing the whole pre-training. For that, you would need a GPU for a week or maybe I would say yeah. maybe even longer than that now. I mean, it depends on the GPU, of course. But H100, maybe a week. Um, but also the other reason is... Um, yeah, in, in practice, you would probably use pre-trained weights and then you can find, yeah. so you can do continued pre-training and then fine tune. So the focus is basically understanding how the pre-training works, then loading pre-trained weights, but then also the fine tuning is like the full, the full thing, like doing it uh, to fine tune a classifier, uh, but also instruction fine tuning essentially. And that doesn't take too long. I would recommend using a GPU, but it would technically run on a, on a um, CPU. And uh, back to the question you had with a 7 billion model for that uh, one A100, I would say, yeah, one, one A100 would uh, probably work um, for a 7 billion model. But you can also, if you have LitGPT or if you use LitGPT as a setting, you can set the number of devices and um, shard it over multiple GPUs. Yeah, I mean, all of this stuff is getting so much easier. I think, what, I don't know, what, when did you start writing this book and all these chapters? Because I've seen the GitHub, I haven't looked when it started. Um, actually, long, uh, longer than you might think. It's uh, It took a long time. It's almost, uh, at this point, one and a half years, approximately. Yep. Because at that time, <laughs> so, yeah. like a one billion parameter model, like what was the state of the art one billion parameter model a year and a half ago? It's some, some random model. But today, like people are trading 1 billion model parameter models for 15 trillion tokens. So like yeah. the fine tuning that you can do there is getting extremely good. And I'm going to guess mm. that 
people are going to start training even smaller models with these distillation losses. So mm -hmm. have you looked at distillation at all? Like, I think it's I, I think it's full on coming in the next six months. Um, we can shift it so to too. like the yeah. Llama 3 mm -hmm. and the state of the open mm -hmm. ecosystem section because it kind of goes in. It's like Llama 3 was not distilled. It's a specific loss mm -hmm. function. I, I hate it that there's um, synthetic data came around and people call, I, I was on this paper, like the Zephyr paper, the title oh, is direct yeah. distillation of language mm -hmm. models. But now the technical definition of distillation, which is like student, like knowledge distillation mm -hmm. from a mm -hmm. teacher is becoming popular. So the whole like mm -hmm. synthetic data and alignment and everything is like screwed in a doubly <laughs> defined yeah, yeah. word. <laughs> So basically what you're saying is that people who just use synthetic data refer to it as distillation because it's from a larger model. Yeah, that's a yeah. bit uh, yeah, confusing. Uh, but I think the true distillation, I think Gemma 2 did that actually uh, recently. So yeah. that was an uh, example where uh, yeah, they, they do, did that. And I do think, you know, uh, I think it's also coming. So I have for my book, this is like the core chapters I have, but I have a whole long list of bonus material that I want to cover. And distillation, knowledge distillation is one of them. <laughs> so this will be something over the next few years, but, um, you know, doing tutorials on those and, yeah. Because I think people can actually use it as a thing. So like how mm -hmm. distillation works, I've thought about implementing it, but as it works is that if you have a, a fine tuning corpus, you get all the predictions from your big model. So all the log probabilities from mm -hmm. your big model and you store them in memory. And then as you're training the model you're training, which is smaller, you, you essentially weight them by those predictions because you store them from memory. So you don't need to store the big model in memory when you're training. Mm -hmm. So you, yeah. so I think people should be able to like, or someone will up a data, upload a data set file of like a giant log probs of Llama 405B and then people mm -hmm. will just try to fine tune from it. Mm. That's I'm, a good point. I'm so, surprised yeah. that Llama 3 didn't use it, but I think it's just because mm. they're, they're, they're focused on scale and data more than any fancy things. Yeah, and I think the uh, the I can I, I think I probably know why, but also yeah, one thing is I should uh, one uh, uh, should also add is why I think it's also becoming more popular is like Llama uh, three point one. Um, they just allowed doing that. I think before it was uh, according to the license technically not allowed to use Llama three models to improve other models, but now now we can. So I think like you said, it's probably gonna yeah. be a, a hot topic. But I do think they didn't do that because the four hundred five B Llama uh, model just finished, I think. So I think, I mean, if you think back, they shared the Llama 3 models like, I don't know, half a year ago or something, Yeah, um, many months ago. So I, I think it's really more like, um, yeah, it hasn't finished training, but maybe for Llama 4, we will see more distillation using the 3.1 uh, model for that. Although, yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah. Oh, it's more architecture thing. So um, I'm, it, for while we're talking about distillation, almost like Claude Fly or Gem, Google Gemini Flash is confirmed as a distillation, and it is very likely mm. that Claude Haiku and GPT-40 Mini are distilled um, mm. in the technical sense of the word, which is like, I, I think it's obvious that that works on pre-training. And I think there will be a breakthrough fine-tuning model, kind of like the likes of Zephyr, um, Starling, I'm forgetting more names, but ones that really reach the narrative from fine from fine-tuning on distilled data. I think I think that'll come in the next six months. So I'm, I'm Honestly, I'm telling the people I work with, we should try to do this before because mm -hmm. it's so, it's so um, obvious yeah. now. <laughs> One thing I've seen also a, a trend, I wouldn't say backwards, but a thing that um, doesn't seem to be that popular anymore is a mixture of expert models. What do you think about that? Is uh, is that like something like that was like a fad and now people don't, you know, they explore other things like distillation. With, I mean, you could do both, but it feels like a mixture of experts is... Um, it's not as hot anymore somehow. I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? Um, there, there's two things. A small mixture of expert models are definitely coming out. Essentially, you get a fixed improvement in um, you get a fixed improvement in flop efficiency at pre-training. So essentially, if you're going to pre-train a like an X billion parameter model with mixture of experts, it'll go like forty percent faster or some pretty mm -hmm. appreciable number. There's a lot of rumors and discussion that scaling up mixture of experts models is really hard from a stability point of view. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these open people, you could get it started and we're playing with these AI too. So like we want to, we want to play in the mixture of experts space as well. 
and doing a small model works, but there's a lot of headaches. I think mm. um, like some of the friends at Databricks Mosaic ML have been in the clearest about this. It's just like, you do not, like you at AI2 do not have the engineering throughput to deal with the headaches that comes from mixture of experts. So I think there's still clear signal from industry and people. And like, I mean, DeepSeek's releasing MOEs. I think Quen, Quen mm. has a small MOE. True, yeah. And these are pretty good models, but I think it's a really heavy engineering lift to get to mm. Make sure experts to work at, 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 at like GPT four scales. I expect mm. Meta to figure it out. I, mm. I I think it's just on their on their list, and they figured out dense first. The thing I'm more interested in for GPT four, I like I don't care if it's a mixture of experts. I think they have the compute to do either way. But I, I or for Llama four, God, all the numbers throw me off so bad. But like, <laughs> um, I think that OpenAI and Google might. Uh, are might be a slightly ahead by having the early fusion model. So essentially with these mm -hmm. multimodal models, there's the concept of early versus late fusion. The first visual models that people were playing with the GPT-4 were this late fusion. And now like GPT-4O is early fusion. And it seems like Gemini is probably early fusion, which means they take in direct audio, video, video, mm -hmm. video text um, directly at the input, the training data mm -hmm. changes. And I don't know how much of a heavy lift it is to get that to work. I think that might be mm. the bigger change. And like mm. that might be harder for Meta to catch up on than, <laughs> than anything mm. else, but no one's really talking about it. But also here, um, I think that is something um, I feel like others have, I mean, there is, I remember even like last year, there were, there were a lot of papers with the late fusion thing, like I think Llama adapter papers and stuff like that, like retrofitting the models. But yeah, I haven't seen that much focus on that from Meta. Meta. I mean, they had a section on that in the paper, but it, it felt almost like an afterthought. I don't know. Um, it's like where, yeah, I, I think maybe there's a different team at Meta that works on that. Or There is a chameleon for... team that was doing this, mm -hmm. and I think a lot I of see. them have left. My, my question essentially that I want to debate and I don't know the answer to is like, because this take, it essentially it takes so much different data pipelines, so you have to have a much mm. clearer balance between video, images, and audio, and text when you're trading early fusion, then with late fusion, because you just add a bunch of images at the end. And like, if that data curation step is going to be a big bottleneck mm. for, for kind of shifting, and if Google and OpenAI have an advantage by just scraping YouTube, like Google obviously mm. can't scrape YouTube, and I'm not saying that they are, but like, if it becomes a way that you can get more data and like GPT 5.0 is the first mm. model that OpenAI releases, then I'll be like, okay, the GPT-40 thing was just a pivot. And I, I actually think this could happen. I don't put this at like a 1% probability. I like I, I could see this as being what the labs are betting on. It just takes so long to spin up this entire new pipeline of training. Mm. But one question here is going back to a point you mentioned earlier uh, regarding the knowledge distillation where you can just pre-compute all these things. You could technically do that also just once for the whole data set. Let's say you have a very good image encoder, audio encoder. You would never have to redo this if you do it well, right? I mean, it would be something you do it, yeah. take care of it once and then you pass it just as tokens to the uh, to the other team, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah, probably. I don't know. I'm not like... I'm, I don't have as much insight into really advanced pre-training practices as, as I would like. I'm mostly of a similar boat of like fine tuning models and playing with mm. things because I'm trying to play, I like, have you played with Llama 3405B at all? Uh, for context, the, the recording is like, what is this? Like a week after, like six days after, yep. mm -hmm. um, yep. like I haven't gotten it set up, but I'm really curious. Like I don't have clear expectations on how the open source community, like the open language model ecosystem kind of evolves from here with these new Llama mm. models and new mm. Mistral models. It feels like a total, from like a technical and a policy perspective for me, it feels like a pivot. I think the educational mm. side of things, it's actually more of the same. Like we, mm. we knew, we knew this was coming, but it just, it, it feels like it could be qualitatively different going forward. Like, do you see anything? Have you tried anything? Um, yeah, I did actually try the Llama uh, 3.1 models. Um, I uh, When they came out last week, uh, we added them to uh, LitGPT. I took care of the um, 8 and 70 billion models. And my colleague, Adrian, he also added support for the 405 billion models. So just briefly trying it, it looks really good. <laughs> so the thing is with the 405 billion model, um, it's a bit tricky. So I think the problem here is, um, I, of course, it's free. Everyone can use it. But in a sense, it's still expensive to run it because you need, um, so we were running it with uh, bits and bytes uh, quantization, like uh, normal float four on eight H100s. And 
this is expensive, right? I mean, H H one hundred. That's probably. I was trying more to than do the same. I messed up the yeah. BLM installation. I was oh, like, okay, yeah. mm -hmm. I spent an hour on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you uh, you can try LitGPT maybe. <laughs> so it works. This is with, one of the. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I know this is a related question. One of the things I'm trying to ask people who are hands on, just like how do what do you do to vibe check a new model? As you go through so much AI research material and language model material, mm. it's like everyone has their procedures and how do mm. you go about that? So for me it's like I I mean I use these more like for uh, making sure they uh, generate the correct answers and stuff like that, or something that is reasonable. So uh, honestly, really simple questions for me just to see. So this is more like I'm not necessarily benchmarking these models. I'm more like making sure the implementation is correct. And for that, I use uh, simple uh, questions like, what do llamas eat? What is one plus two? You know, like just making sure because it's actually easy. Uh, something I just fixed this morning. It's easy to mess up things like KB caching where uh, you cache, uh, you don't clear the cache and then there's something from the previous answer and the answer looks kind of correct, but it's kind of weird. And, you know, like simple questions can sometimes reveal that. So basically what I do is um, I ask it multiple multiple questions um, the same time. Uh, so sorry, uh, repeatedly, like the same question repeatedly and see if the outputs still make sense and stuff and then mixing them up but like in a loop basically but i'm not so much like um that's know, a like great way to make sure them. the implementation yeah. works because i think mm -hmm. in transformers they had a missing end token there's so many little mm -hmm. things like this when implementing mm -hmm. the the like the the end tokens is such a bane or like the chat templating can always break mm -hmm. things because it also can happen that you mess up pre-training and then you need to have something in the chat template that people might not know. Mm -hmm. I think in one yep. of the early Olmo models, we like missed a new line in mm -hmm. uh, in one of our documents when we were annealing it. So in order to fine tune it, you had to like have an extra new line before the chat mm -hmm. template, and like most people will just miss that. <laughs> yeah, this is very a uh, very uh, interesting point. It's like you don't even notice it usually when you use something like uh, I don't know ChatGPT because it's applied behind the scenes. But if you implement these things yourself, you have to be really diligent and careful to do it very consistently. Like one little, like you said, new line throws it totally off. Um, it's it's yeah, it's interesting. It's like you have to be. Yeah, I, I noticed that I was actually working on uh, some DPO stuff this weekend, and my template for fine tuning and DPO alignment, the prompt template, was a bit different and. I I got like garbage results and then oh i i stripped some line here the new line character basically something similar like you said so it's it's very sensitive to that yeah yeah this this makes sense um related do you use claude chat gpt any of these mm -hmm. regularly in your workflow are you team claude yep. Uh, I, so it dep yeah, so I, it depends. I have both <laughs> and I flip back and forth between them. I don't know. I'm probably not really good at prompting, but sometimes I get better results with one over the other. Um, I think. I wouldn't say one is better than the other. They're just different, I would say. That's, I'm using that's kind though, of what I think. It's important. Yeah. Like, it's good. Like, what do you think of both of them? I think it's good for people to know this because it's it takes some practice to understand and <laughs> using both. Most people don't use both. Yeah, I, I would say when I use also GPT-4, I must say I use the, uh, it, it's called Legacy now, but the original GPT-4, I don't like the mini Same. and O versions. <laughs> and uh, for Claude, I use is it the Opus, um, the, not the new one, but the one, the previous larger one, the slower one. And um, I think for me, it's like coding wise, it's kind of weird, but most of the time I like GPT-4 better for code stuff, but then... I think also, uh, I think, you know, what, what's better with GPT-4 was it's it's a bit more up to date um, with knowledge, I think. But uh, Claude has, I think, better, you know, when you say improve my writing or something like that, it has more, it has less, you know, like these, like I delve into something, these weird words and stuff like it. It's a less, it's more natural a bit, I would say, but also not I, always. I it's agree. kind of, you know. It, it, it's like, it has a bit more flair. And a bit more yeah. unpredictability. So I, I like using Claude on my phone, but I've found I've tried to use Claude for like information transformation tasks, like LaTeX or taking taking data out of a table. And sometimes it just like refuses. Like I do research on mm -hmm. like AI safety, like safety and bias. So if I put anything into Claude that I'm trying to transform that data, it just says no because it's like I can't <laughs> comment on a, like a mean story. Mm -hmm. Well, as OpenAI will we'll just do it, and it's like mm -hmm. kind of the processing that OpenAI does is very good. 
So I, I actually like canceled my GPT subscription when I started Quad, but I kind of regret it. Now I'm like, oh, now I need both, which is which is a little annoying. Yeah, it's like, um, yeah. I, so one thing is, what is interesting though is we we're talking about GPT four and Cloud here, but we haven't even mentioned uh, Google Gemini. I don't know. I personally, I tried the early versions. Uh, I don't want to say the newer versions are not good. I just haven't tried because I didn't need to. But um, I, do you have experiences with uh, Gemini or? I was using Gemini in search preview. So if you have the Google app, I can, I'm mm -hmm. recording this in, in video. Like you have the Google app, like at the top, you could click mm -hmm. on Gemini, which I was doing for a while just to play with it. But like, mm -hmm. I don't use it on the web. I, they do have a nice interface that looks exactly the same, but somehow I got grandfathered into like AI studio, which I use for, if I upload, record a podcast, I upload the podcast and I'm like, write chapters <laughs> or something. Mm -hmm. And it actually mm -hmm. works, which is pretty cool mm -hmm. to be able to upload mm -hmm. like an hour long podcast. But for whatever reason, the Google interface other than the Google app hasn't stuck for me. And I think that's the biggest, biggest limitation. Mm -hmm. And I use it more in yeah. a googly way. So I'd not, I'm, I'm not as perceptive to style. Mm, I see. I see. So also, I'm curious. I just yesterday saw Apple's uh, on-device AI uh, is a bit delayed. I think, and for that, I think it's an interesting one. We will see how how this will work because this will be, I think, also smaller models. And there's a for me, it's like I never really care about speed for these things. It's like I just want the best possible model. So this is also why I was a bit disappointed when uh, GPT-4 O came out and GPT-4 Mini came out. It's like, eh, I don't really care about um, if it's faster or not. I just want it better. You know, I want to have better quality. I don't know. It's uh, Maybe it's just Yeah, me, I but, think for uh, building applications, speed is really good. So I have a yeah, few friends like, that yeah. run startups that are heavily built on language models, and they have a similar stack to Perplexity, which is like... The user passes in a query that have a primary language model request and they have a series of feedback requests or small requests on top of that. So when you're concatenating multiple requests, like speed is extremely important. And when you're like selling a product, speed is extremely important. But if you're like tinkering and trying to learn, it is much slower. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the real world, like, sorry, not real world, but the individual user, um, yeah, using it as a tool in everyday life versus really building an application based on an API that, that makes sense. Yeah. So they're two different use cases. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're kind of talking about style. I have a section on RLHF here. I just wanted to like, mm -hmm. what do you think you just spend a lot so much on AI education and it's like, what do you think is most confusing to people about this kind of whole post training thing, which is instruction tuning, reinforcement learning from human feedback, other safety modules, like adding a filter and stuff like this. Cause like, I'm really on the bandwagon of trying to convince people that RLHF is deeply tried with style, which is like this mm -hmm. how the, this discussion of Claude versus um, mm -hmm. OpenAI and Google and all these things. And I don't really know how to portray that in like an educational technical point of view. So like I'll do an analysis of a paper and I'll do like DPO mm -hmm. and like scores and all these things. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, for most people reading my articles, the most important thing is probably to know that OpenAI is really smart about their style. And that's why they're mm -hmm. so high on chatbot arena. Mm -hmm. But like mm -hmm. I, I've written about it a couple of times and I have another article in the drafts, which is essentially like why GPT-40 mini like broke chatbot arena because everyone's mm. so upset that it scored so highly but it's not that surprising if you look at historical events so, no, so like, it's basically what exploitation you... of the benchmark almost you you're saying or uh, like the benchmark is focused it... on style and it yeah. really penalizes refusals so like mm -hmm. I get refusals mm -hmm. when I use Claude so it's definitely gonna like be downweighted mm. and like open AI is really good at this this is what they've been mm. doing for a long time but I don't really know how to educate this like have you thought mm. about like there was a question on Twitter of why didn't you include RLHF in your latest book? Oh. <laughs> Which yeah, is kind um, of a joke, but I took yeah. note. <laughs> well, if yeah, I can maybe answer that. It's um, it's in the works. <laughs> no, so there are multiple yeah. reasons. Um, so one is um, it, it's so there are page limits per chapter. And originally it was meant to be in chapter seven. It got way too long. It's actually even without it, chapter seven is the longest chapter already. And um, what is the other seven? one is fine tuning. Uh, oh, sorry. Instruction fine tuning. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it, yeah. I called it not instruction fine tuning. I called it fine tuning to follow instructions, which were originally, which was That's originally smart. meant to have yeah, <laughs> both, but then it got too long. And the other thing is, you know, like one book chapter takes about two months and there are a lot of people who really want a book before the new semester starts. So it's like, um, you know, it's, there could be another chapter on it, but it would be another two months. And the, 
that I mean, it's not really an excuse, but the other one is I was not happy with the results. And this is a ma very mathy topic. And I was like, okay, I have this book, which make, is very clear and makes hopefully a lot of sense. And then I have this really um, super complicated chapter at the end. I don't know if that's very satisfying to on, on as a reader. Chat. Yeah, where it's like, so you read this book, everything makes sense, and then comes this, this huge... Why uh, is RLHF yeah. so much mathier? Like, I know a couple, there's a couple mm -hmm. core equations. Like, the core equation is, like, the RL optimization step, which mm -hmm. is expect expectation maximization mm -hmm. of reward subject to some penalty. And, mm -hmm. and, like, where does most of the... like. I compare yeah, to but, pre-trading, which yeah, is like one yeah. equation, like that is also mm -hmm. one equation, but there's a lot of downstream stuff, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's the explaining a bit about um, reinforcement learning. I mean, you don't, I mean, you don't really have to explain reinforcement learning in a classic sense, maybe, but yeah, there's still like um, KL divergence and uh, penalties and reward margins. And there are lots of um, things happening at the same time. And the code is also very long if you especially want to track the uh, rewards and stuff. So yeah. for my um, instruction fine tuning chapter, I'm using exactly the same uh, training um, function I implemented in the pre-training chapter. And it's really nice. It's like, well, you can actually reuse everything. It's It fits together. Yeah, and like what we're doing on Omo, we could we can baseline our instruction fine tuning in our fine tuning code base, which also has some RL things and in our pre-training code base. So it's, mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah. it's nice to have both, but that is definitely why it's simpler. Yeah. It, and the RL is only getting worse in my mind, I think. Like we've seen that Llama has used rejection sampling for two iterations and there's no mm -hmm. public implementation of rejection sampling that is mm -hmm. at least public enough to know that people have actually trained models with it, which is the idea of taking complete ranking completions through a reward model and then running instruction mm -hmm. tuning again yeah, on the top is, completions. I think also in um in yeah in the recent Llama 3.1 paper they used rejection sampling with DPO for example like they had they didn't yeah. use the RLHF with reward model but then they used the reward model for the rejection sampling. And yeah so I I must say I was um I have the code for the DPO. Um, I wanted to d do TPO because it's also more resource efficient. You don't have to uh, train that reward model for, let's say, the book. But I was not really happy with the quality of the output yet. So I must say, it's like, okay, this is not, it's not helping the instruction fine tune model. And it's like, I think, a general thing where I, I mean, you might uh, correct me if I'm wrong here because you are the expert in RLHF. But for me, it's like, it's like a optional thing where unless you need a specific style or need to deploy something in like a safe manner, it's maybe not giving you the best results. If you need a private model that just runs on your own computer and gives you correct answers, I don't think DPO or um, RLHF will make the answers more correct. They will just change how they look like. And yeah, you know, I, I mostly you know. agree, especially on what we have in public implementations. Like the public implementations are really good at improving on like alpaca eval. But if I'm training mm. a model that I actually want to use, don't worry about alpaca eval. I think I'm like I'm the most annoying person internally running these experiments because I just get so annoyed when only alpaca eval goes up and like that has made the model worse. Like we've. Mm -hmm. I've been building internal demo tools, which is just like making Gradio better and showing how to use VLLM for serving. But it's like a lot of the models we put out for research are like really, really annoying to talk to. It's like you put no yapping or, or just be concise mm -hmm. in the prompt and it doesn't do anything. So like yeah. a lot of the open data sets, and this is something that Nibatron and Llama 3 have shifted to is this new evaluation, which is like IF eval, which stands for instruction following eval, which I think is a great one. So it's like, write a respond with less than 300 words or something mm -hmm. and it has these verifiable claims and this is something that the nematron report showed that like doing f fine tuning really unlocked a lot more performance in on the in the dpo stage so i'm hoping that we start to get more evals than just alpaca eval that are helped by this rlhf and the, that'll help the whole ecosystem come forward because it, it is in a kind of young rough state mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. Yeah, and also one last thing about this topic is for me, um, like you said, the last sentence is kind of also one of the reasons is where I was like, okay, if I include something on DPO as the last chapter, 
I don't know if it's still going to be used next year or if there's there are so many variants, Orpo and KTO. And I mean, right now, I mean, Lama 3.1 used DPO, which is like a big endorsement. But to be honest, I'm not sure if this exact variant is here to stay. And so I think DPO um, is here to say DPO will be right. a canonical example, much mm, like PPO. Mm. But I think the mm. things that people are using will go away. Like PPO has stood mm. the test of time of multiple eras of RL. So I don't mm. think that people use it in its exact form, but people are always be looking sense, at yeah. it and same with DPO, just because DPO is so mean. simple. Like the mm -hmm. exercise, this is like one of the best getting started with RLHF exercise is taking like the hugging face trainer and modifying it to use the DPO loss because you could use mm. all the other infrastructure for like most of the infrastructure for batching and stuff like this. And then add that loss function, which is a few lines of code and like, that's a good, that's like the entry point to doing RLHF implementations. Like when I interview people, I'm like, make sure that they have looked at this DPO loss mm -hmm. function before. Mm -hmm. And if they haven't, I'm like, I don't know if you're in the weeds enough. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> you should look at this. <laughs> and uh, if you need, as if you are listening to this and you are about to uh, get interviewed by Nathan, I will hopefully have by next weekend a <laughs> tutorial on DPO up on implementing it from scratch. I was, this weekend I used actually Llama 3.1 to make a synthetic data set for that and got much better results. So it looks good good enough to probably upload it next week. <laughs> so nice. Yeah. Okay. Let's shift gears into like AI research and AI education, which is, I think the thing that you have some of the most insight into. So you're a head of AI newsletter. You I've, I wasn't originally reading it when I subscribed, but now I almost always skim through to kind of see what papers you uncover. I'm pretty interested in like how you select papers, like how much you actually prioritize reading papers and mm -hmm. why, and just like mm -hmm. any advice for people, because it's hard to sit down and do this. And mm -hmm. I, I speaking for myself, sometimes writing is like how I force myself to read some papers. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're in the same boat, but like, what is your worldview around reading AI papers these days and skepticism or excitement and everything? <sighs> Yeah, it's a big topic. Uh, so I must say, so I I look at more paper than I actually literally read. I mean, I, I look at the abstracts and the titles and then that's like a huge funnel as a selection process. So I must say for like, uh, I was an archive moderator for the machine learning archive um, a few years back and that got me into the habit. Um, so how it worked was basically as a, so maybe it's useful because some people complain. Yeah, how does when someone a, become an archive moderator? I didn't know um, that it was like a community <laughs> position. Um, it is. So there was originally by Tom Dietrich. Uh, he was doing it by himself and he was looking for people to help him with that because as, yeah, as you mentioned, there is an ever increasing uh, number of papers. And so how it works is essentially that um, when you submit a paper to archive, you select the categories, uh, but a lot of people, they select not, let's say um, the correct, I wouldn't say not correct, but like the preferred categories because um yeah the ai and an, ml it's like ml ai yeah. and then everything else <laughs> yeah and ai in in archive is interesting it's more like the um classic ai it's like it's not llms it's more like symbolic ai that, that kind of stuff a gold what gold do you old think the difference AI. between or like as an educator how do you define ai and machine learning this is also one of my favorite interview questions to so like see where they're at <laughs> Well, right now I would say uh, I go back and forth uh, on that. I, right now I would say um, AI is this big umbrella thing where you have deep learning and machine learning as um, subfields. But if you think about it, if you consider a logistic regression classifier, it is essentially machine learning. And if machine learning is the subfield of AI, you would say, okay, then <laughs> logistic regression must be AI. But is like classifying iris flowers really AI? I don't know. <laughs> so today I would well, say- I also, also think about search as AI. Yeah, like, yeah, like the, uh, uh, page rank yeah. and yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So this is like the good old fashioned AI. So I would say with AI, yeah, you have both, you have the uh, machine learning and deep learning branches, but you have also, you can also implement AI with if else statements, I guess, like, you know, yeah. like, uh, so, so that's how I would define AI. But I think nowadays when people talk about AI, they mean specifically gen AI, like generative, um, AI models, like LLMs, um, stable diffusion, that type of stuff. Um, but yeah, so the archive thing. Um, so just briefly, um, uh, um, basically there is in the background, it's also using machine learning, uh, uh, NLP to detect whether the title 
based on the title and the abstract if the, the category is actually matching. And if there's a mismatch or in general, as moderator, you go through them and, oh, this looks good, this looks good, this looks good. They started Sometimes exposing people... this to the user. So I submitted a paper mm -hmm. recently under ML and it was like, this looks like it, yep. language. And I was like, mm -hmm. I've been in moderate, I've gotten papers stuck in moderation. So I was like, I'm always going to hit accept if they tell me it might be in the wrong category because archive moderation is a black box that you don't want to get stuck in. No, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like as a user, <laughs> but I understand the service it's providing. So it's good mm -hmm. to expose that to the user. And if anyone's listening, just click yes. Click yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's yeah. not worth delaying your release to mm -hmm. get stuck mm -hmm. in moderation and help yeah. archive out. <laughs> yeah. And so just the last thing on that is by default, everything gets accepted. However, sometimes there's it's something gets flagged if there's duplicate content, um, if it doesn't look uh, like a paper, sometimes people submit like one page blog posts or something. So there is this yeah. um, thing where sometimes there are also false positives and then it gets stuck. But long story short, that got me into the habit of um, reading the titles. And that's what I still do also for my head of AI newsletter. I just look through the titles and select. How have titles changed? changed? Like titles have changed a mm -hmm. lot though, as I feel like they used to try to be um, accurate. mostly descriptive. <laughs> oh, accurate, but, yeah, descriptive, right? Like, uh, and, and now yeah. they are a mix of, it's more of a storytelling than descriptive, I mm -hmm. think is the right uh, yeah, 100%. way to tell it. At least we don't have the, <laughs> it's all you need anymore. I feel like this uh, went away finally, but yeah, yeah. you're right. It's more, um, it, it ended uh, with yeah, Ryland Schaefer's test set is training on test is all you need, yep. which did the that make it on one. archive? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it did. I think I also had it uh, featured in my <laughs> newsletter one time, I think. Yeah. Well, not featured, but at least mentioned. <laughs> yeah. And so how I select take papers is also often selfish. Um, I read or select papers for the newsletter that I find interesting. And because I think this is also for education. Uh, when people ask me about uh, how I would suggest doing things is I think the most important thing is to yeah, talk and work on things you are interested in. I think it would be really hard to do a good job if it's a topic that is not interesting to you. For example, I know, uh, I don't know, R, uh, sorry, or Rust is interesting, a very important topic, but I'm not into it. So I, I don't try to, let's say, um, it's make videos great advice. or content <laughs> on that. Yeah. So it's like, if I think if there's something you're excited about, I think it comes almost naturally that you want to talk about it. <laughs> so um, in, in that sense. So the newsletter, I almost, it's, it's weird, but I almost write it for myself. It's like, um, yeah. I find it like interesting. How much do you just... spend reading versus writing when you're reading these papers mm -hmm. and writing a blog post? Um, I think I'm guessing the, a lot of it is just the natural process of synthesis yeah. is what you put into the yeah. newsletter. It's not like you're mm. doing it from my read. It's not like you're doing a ton of scaffolding and editing after the fact, which seems similar to what yeah. I do. Yeah, uh, you're right. I don't do I, I don't spend too much time on it in the sense that I, I wish I could, but I have a full time job. It's literally just a weekend project where um, I aim for one newsletter per month. Of course, I would like to do more, but there was also a book to write on weekends or sometimes when I do yeah. videos, it's like keeping it fun, you know, like where it's like, okay, this is not a chore. This is something that is supposed to be fun, you know, like uh, in that sense, um, I read a paper and then I take notes and then I collect them and spend maybe half an hour, an hour to yeah polish them a bit up or make some figures. And that's it per paper, I would say. And so I also don't write the whole newsletter on one day or one weekend. It's really uh, spread over the month. I, I read a paper. Oh, this is an interesting one for other people. Let's write this up basically. And then this way I collect uh, material over the month. And then, yeah. What motivates you to work on this stuff? It, uh, is it purely like yeah. education? Cause I, 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 in some mm -hmm. ways relate to that. I've been in that mm -hmm. mode before. Yeah. So I, I, if you have noticed, I don't have any sponsorships or something, never done that. Uh, Respect. I, I will never <laughs> say never, but uh, it's not something I do. It's really just yeah, a hobby. And I do like discussions that come around it. There is a certain satisfaction that if you put it out, it helps others and people tell you positive things about it. It's kind of very gratifying. I don't know. There's like a reward in, in a sense. And what's also cool is um, there are a lot of people, it's like being part of the community and exchanging uh, information because there are also a lot of people who sometimes know something I don't know. And this is really, I think, really cool. You write about something and then someone, hey, have you seen this? This seems like it's 
taking it to yet another level or this is um, the same idea it's even better or something and, and and this is super cool where you get this um effect where you learn by doing this actually because someone there's always someone who knows a bit more than you do in a specific area so yeah yeah, I feel like it's increasingly important these days and increasingly impactful because so much of research has become closed off and for business mm. reasons. So there's fewer people that do more of the work. I feel like I always thought it surprised. Like people don't realize how few people are informed and share on any given topic, like AI research. Like it, if you take away three people, like, I, like I've yet to find people that just tweet the same like random RLHF crap that I tweet. It's like... I don't do it because like I just say random things, but there's not that many people that represent each of these quarters, like a head of AI. I think like Jack Clark's in poor AI. I should have him mm. on the pod. I, I think I've talked to him a few times. He's mm. great to talk to. And his is the same thing. It's like these few mm. people that are disseminating AI information, which is like crucial for policy and future angles. Um, do you, have you ever gotten criticism that your work is accelerating AI and that you are a safety risk? I've gotten some harsh, some critical Not emails yet. that are like, you shouldn't talk about this. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I've more gotten emails about... Um, that the fact that I talk about LLMs uh, is not good because LLMs violate copyrights. I mean, not that I do it, but that uh, other people's LLMs do it. And I, I talk about these LLMs. I'm happy that I haven't yeah. had this audience very much, but it seems this is like one of the challenges of having a tech audience is like you cultivate it in kind of one of two, like there's multiple ways to go. And one of them is like this all data is for language models is theft thing. And mm. I just don't know how to deal with it because like mm. I disagree, but the normally people that aren't receptive to it, which is really hard. It, it needs to I be played also, out in yeah, the court. Yeah, yeah. For uh, my book also just, um, yeah, to make extra sure, uh, all the data I use there is, um, so the pre-training data is public domain data, like a book a book from um, Project Gutenberg. And for instruction nice. fine-tuning, I did my, I created my own data set basically. So just to avoid uh, any issues, you know, like- Did um, you do, you wrote it by hand? Yep. So I took, uh, no, actually I used, um, okay, I, I used part of an LLM and some part by hand. Yeah. So I-, I It's a great exercise. Alpaca. Yeah. Yeah, and um, for the synthetic one, I I, I use Llama three point one now too. I mean, yeah, you can tell me also about that a bit. I mean, that's maybe interesting for the audience how to generate a preference data set because there are multiple ways. I mean, naturally, it's crowdsourced, right? So you ask people, uh, you have the model generate two answers or have flavors of the model generate um, answers, and then oh, which one do you prefer? But it's not really scalable, and so. Uh, you could technically do the same thing with an LLM. You could uh, basically have the LLM generate a more polite version. Because I think LLMs are very good at, um, even the small LLMs, the open source 7B models, are good at rephrasing things or uh, evaluating things. They're not necessarily good to generate the answer in the first place if they don't have a reference. But given a reference, I think it's it's super useful to use open source LMs in, in that sense. I'm surprised that this hasn't caught on sooner, but I think it's starting to catch on. I think in the meta report, they essentially have edits. So then they rank, their, mm. they make their preference pairs as edited, better than chosen, better than rejected. And that's like, you can create multiple players by binarizing. Um, there's a few research projects that have done this where they have like, or constitutional AI is popular, but that's not really reproduced. One of my one of my collaborators slash friends at Synth AI Labs, Luis Castricado, he did a paper on like, the pink elephant problem, which is like using revisions to get the model to not just say whatever is in the question if you ask it not to. We did a follow up work that's out like literally today, which is like on self directed synthetic dialogues where you have the language model generate a plan and then it follows mm -hmm. the plan. And then you could also do revisions on it. So I think it, and Nematron did mm -hmm. this with prompts. So it, it's really getting going, but it's something that took longer than I expected. Expected. There's the kind of question. There's this is a whole. This is like too big of a topic to go into. But it's like, how do you do? You use GPT four feedback? Do you use like? Are your completions from two different models or the same model with different generation settings? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do you use humans? I think that the labs are using humans for preference data because it eliminates some of the problems in language modeling. And then that's one of the biggest impactful research questions in alignment. It's like we can't afford the one to ten million dollar data set how do we do this and that's what we're, mm -hmm. we're starting a project to do that at ai2 right now and I, I i it's a big open like i don't know where it'll go i don't know mm -hmm. how much like how far can we reproduce the llama 3 alignment methods i 
<laughs> yeah, I was. I would so I would say the Lama three point one paper or the Lama three paper. It was like a ninety three page paper, and it was great. I love it. It's like a lot of detail, but on the alignment part, I feel like I wish there was more information about it. Even like Lama two had more information where they showed. What is the improvement actually over the different stages when they added to supervised fine tuning? And I so, feel like so I'm talking to Ross Taylor tomorrow, and mm -hmm. I'm going to ask him the specific thing um, <laughs> awesome. on latent yeah. space. Like Thomas S, one of the leads, said that most of their gains come from RLHF than SF rather than SFT. So I think the open source mm -hmm. community is over indexed on instruction fine tuning mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it is accessible and we have the data. And this is one of this is like one of my like. And like try to guide in the community by doing things is like go do our whole job. Go to like don't worry about mm -hmm. instruction tuning data sets. Like don't worry about that. We'll just leave that mm -hmm. the same and go find more preference data and keep playing with this. And like don't worry about the DPO methods. Like just literally go make preference data and keep trying to train mm -hmm. things. Like don't don't yeah, implement a new loss yeah. function. <laughs> Practical question as uh, to an expert like you. If you uh, how good is actually a so preference data set if you download it if it's not if both the chosen and the rejected answers, if you don't know the preference data set, they're not generated by your model, right? And if you have a model and you use the responses that the model has never basically seen before, does this actually work or would it be um, advisable? So the most, that? the two most popular preference data sets in the open right now are ultra feedback and nectar or variants of them. Both of those are collected from large suites of other models. And part mm -hmm. of my, and there haven't been data sets or papers that have trained really good models using on policy preference data from the model you're mm -hmm. training. And mm -hmm. I think th that's a question that we need to answer is like, how do mm -hmm. we get ultra feedback level results with on policy data? Because mm -hmm. all the labs are using on policy data. Yep, exactly. I wrote yeah. about this in like buried in one article. I have a theory that ultra feedback and nectar, these general data sets work so well because within them, there is something close enough to your distribution and you don't mm -hmm. have to get it quite right. But it's just like a, a gentler, more uniform learning signal for the models doing preference tuning. But we don't, we don't know. That's something that I want. Yeah. That's something that I want to answer. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah an interesting uh, one. I would also like to know the answer because uh, that is one thing where I got a bit stuck when I was writing this uh, DPO chapter with smaller models. I think bigger models also they hide these um, weaknesses a bit because they have been trained on so much data that, like you said, it, it's kind of in distribution already. But if you train a small model. It would be out of distribution, right? If you use someone else's preference data set. So I noticed even something simple when you train a model on, on one simple instruction data set, let's say as uh, something like Alpaca. And then let's say you have a, just for to have something visual, you want the model to generate Yoda speech, you know, like where every sentence is uh, reversed. But the model has never seen sentences like that unless it was maybe in the training data. But in, in that sense, it doesn't work well at all because you ask the model during preference tuning to write sentence structures it has never grammatically written before. And so in that sense, I think what I found is it's much better if, yeah, if you, I don't know, you say be more polite or like you have a more polite answer because you use the same grammar. So, so things like that yeah. basically. And yeah. Yeah. I think that's a smart approach. It also might be why learning rates are getting so low where like all mm -hmm. the learning rates for DPO and things have been going down in the fine tuning space. And it might just because dis distributionally or like we're far off from the model. Like mm. there's the other theory that the model is like really, really done training. So they get it to a really good optimum and you don't want to move it from them, but it might just be that like our data sets are in the wrong space. Yeah. So you try to be gentler with a, lo a lower learning rate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, all of this stuff changes fast, but not fast enough. Like this ultra feedback data set they were talking about came out last October. So we're like mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. 10 months in and it's still the state of the art data set. And it's only mm -hmm. like 50,000 examples. So there's so much opportunity for someone to like, this one, like go build data sets. If anyone is watching, cause it's like, yeah. I think we're so far off where we could be just because it's, people don't know how to make good preference data sets. Well, no, we have Llama 3.1, uh, 70 and 405 billion that allows us to do that. Right. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering, this is a change of topic, but how do you think, like, do you think AI will change our jobs in writing? Like, how do you see AI coming for this kind of educational space? Like how mm -hmm. much of what you do as an educator could be taken in N years by AI? Well, I think it's like, of course, it will automate away some things because nowadays you would ask a model something instead of searching for it and reading it on a website. But I do think 
the the creation process you still need a human to put it together well because i don't know i think llms are not nowhere near like generating a whole article that is actually i would say even good uh, where it can generate the right things but you still have to put it together it can generate good blocks of text or something like that but you need to as an edit like you become maybe more like the editor than in that sense yeah. but do you um, try this also, like do you um, write do you have ai write any parts of your articles i'm so scared uh, for like moral reasons to have any yeah. ai writing in it i'm like it's just a slippery slope mm -hmm. it feels like i could get addicted yeah, <laughs> yeah so sometimes I, I don't have it write anything from scratch but i sometimes do do that when especially i don't know i have a I mean, I'm a non-native language speaker, and sometimes I have a, yeah. a harder time than other days to make this sound right. It's like, okay, this is what I want to say, but it doesn't sound right. And then I, can you revert this with a focus on X, Y, Z or something? So like, uh, it, it's basically like a, you know, like a thesaurus where you find similar words, you find similar sentences, like just yeah. rewording it, like these types of things. But one also, uh, now that you mentioned it, one weakness it has, or LMs can't do really, um, is they can't generate figures. You know, maybe that's coming. <laughs> I don't know. You can do that probably with uh, ticks, like the LaTeX thing where at one point, but right now, nowhere near can you generate any useful figure. And I think learning is very visual too. Like I think if it's just text it would be really hard to learn anything um yeah so it, it, you can of course but i do think you know there's a saying uh image is worth a thousand words right so uh, yeah in, in that sense you, you still need someone you know like the mastermind behind uh an yeah. article even if it's just an editor i, I don't think lms can replace everything yet, at least and we'll see i mean i don't know how much better i mean we, we just don't know how much better let's say gpt5 as a placeholder here will be than gpt4 you know so maybe if it's saturating who, who knows right so maybe it will be five years more years till we yeah get in a more scarier territory in terms of replacements you know so we'll see yeah i mostly avoid the agent word but it does seem like there's enough culture and cultural investment in the bay area and tech executives to do something like they're going to get to something that is triable, which mm -hmm. I think is mm -hmm. mostly like automatic Google searching, more code execution, which is going to be interesting, but I have such wide expectations of what it actually means. And I, like uh, that's, that's probably the next big shift. I think like this Llama 3.1 is probably right now, like leading the year in terms of AI news. Um, this recent deep mind thing on the math might be a better a better example of what's really hot news i need to go read more about it there's some long write ups on like how the ai the qualitative between like the ai math and the human math in the different directions they're going so that's kind of what i want to read about it but i it it'll shake things up we're, we're multiple years into this fast pace mm. it's not exactly new at this point yeah well last thing on that is i do think though llms make good assistance in the literal sense where like one thing where i use it for my newsletter for is like i at the end i have a list of uh, all the papers i have found interesting like i don't 30 50 papers usually and usually per hand i um edit the author um names like the first the last names of the first three authors and now i use uh an llm to go to the website and get the the names of the authors basically and and so oh, this awesome. is where <laughs> yeah and, and this is where it saves a lot of time you could do that without llms you could write some code to do that but you know it would probably take me half a day to write some <laughs> because i'm not good at this web scraping yeah. code to to do that type of thing and i think in that sense it is actually a useful assistant for certain things like delegating yeah. Things, I think know, it'll but, um, steep. It, it'll keep creeping up. Like I don't expect their mm -hmm. usage for those things to go down because they already mm -hmm. are so useful. And the little, the little mm -hmm. coding things, the hacking data together, the automatic searching. Like people aren't going to want to stop using that. I don't know if it supports the whole valuation we have, but it's fun to be in a space where we get to try new things. And as, as like a computer nerd, it's really fun to have a new type of software that we can try all sorts mm -hmm. of things in our mm -hmm. workflow. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's underrated. <laughs> so. I don't know. Thanks for coming on. Any any last things you want to discuss? Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for the invitation, and I hope yeah, keep creating these awesome uh, newsletters. I I think this is much needed, like because there's so much hype, like you said uh, previously, like uh, it's creeping up on us. There's a lot of over, let's say, evaluation and praise, and I think something that is 
kind of like cutting through this is um, it's much needed like this, uh, you know, honest, straightforward, no bullshit content. So um, yeah, I hope you keep creating that. I was, it was fun to chat and yeah, to everyone out there, I think also it's like, uh, it, it's what keeps us motivated, I think, is the awesome community that people give feedback and discuss things and bring things up. And yeah, I think uh, without people also giving us feedback, we wouldn't be probably doing this because it's um, it's like it's kind of a, a lot of fun to be in that space, I must say. Yeah, like the it's fast moving, but there's always something interesting every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is really interesting. We covered a lot of kind of low level of just like what it's like trying to use language models on the day to day basis and july 2024 so thanks for coming on and i'm sure we'll talk soon bye bye yep most nice meeting you and see you then bye